Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, and the speaker's choice reading can be found on uh, Roman numeral page 28. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. Hi, my name is Adolf. I am an alcoholic, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I, I hope you will get something out of this. I know I did in preparing for it. Um, when I came into the program almost 33 years ago, it'll be 33 years next month if I make it, um, I was teaching business law to accounting students at Canisius College. Um, as I say, I had a bank account, a girlfriend, and I was putting my resume together and sending it out in hopes of finding another job. Now, that may sound like that's not so bad. You know, you got money in the bank, the girlfriend didn't leave yet, and you were able to put together a resume coherently so that you could do a job search. The only problem was that I was a Roman Catholic priest, and so the bank account, the girlfriend, and the job search were breaking all my vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And these were not minor violations. These were, bi this is as bad as you could get it. Right? And though I tried to justify it and say I needed this, uh, they don't understand me, the stresses are too much, the truth was that it was tearing me up inside and it drove me over the edge to drink. Now, believe me, I was rather tightly wired before that, but that was only the final incident that drove me over the edge. Uh, for 20 years of my life, from ages 18 to 38, I was able to have only two drinks, um, except for seven occasions, and I think I can remember all of them, spread out over those 20 years. Seven occasions I got drunk, but otherwise, you know, what, what, what getting drunk taught me was you have to be careful. Alcohol, while it tastes good, it kind of loosens you up a little bit, and it might push you over that edge of you need to stop before it gets too bad. And so I was always able to stop, except for those seven occasions. One day, however, I noticed that I had been drunk for four days in a row. Um, and I said, this can't be. I, I mean, I worked days and I worked evenings. Uh, I, I taught in the day school. I taught in the evening school. I did research in my office. That's what priests did at the college. We worked, right? Um, I can't be drunk. I got too much work to do, and I couldn't do it. I tried to stop, and that's when I discovered that I could not stop. Um, I tried all the tricks, well, a lot of the tricks that are in the big book. You know, I'm just going to have to, I, I just need to concentrate a little harder. I need to apply a little more willpower. I'll only have wine with dinner, or I'll only drink on weekends, or I'll only drink on special occasions. None of that worked, right? I drank every day for a year and a half, and I was drunk every day. Um, my friend Dave N., uh, I don't want to say his last name, said to me once, uh, you only drank for a year and a half? Dave drank for 20 years, and he used to put away a quart or two of scotch a day, right? He looked at me, he said, you only drank for a year and a half? Um, so, what well, can I tell you? I'm a wuss, even as a drunk, right? But I can tell you that it was the worst year in my life, worst year and a half in my life. It was the most miserable time, the most pain, painful time in my life because I got nothing done. I was twisted up with guilt, remorse, 
crazy feelings that I couldn't control and I just wanted them to go away. I couldn't do my work. Everything was falling apart, right? And there's nothing I could do about it. Now, in truth, I only tried to stop drinking for a year every day, for a year, right? After a year of trying all those tricks, I gave up. I couldn't, I, I could not stop, and I couldn't even try anymore. I was really beaten inside, and I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and so for the last six months, I just drank. And I thought, I thought, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to be a failure. I'm going to get drunk every day until I die of old age. Now, I didn't know anything about the disease, and in particular, I didn't know that the disease was progressive, so it never occurred to me that if I get drunk every day and it gets worse, I might not make old age, right? That wasn't in my thinking, but that's all I could think of. I'm going to be drunk every day until I die of old age. Now, one of the problems with my work, uh, I was a professor I had to do research and publish um, articles in scholarly journals in order to keep my job. I heard early on, I heard, I think there's a law student out here in the, I heard somebody talking in the back before the meeting. Um, if you want to know what this kind of publishing is, I, I did eventually do it. I couldn't do it for a long time. I did eventually do it, but in a 40-page article, I had 244 footnotes, right? Um, sometimes I had one line on a page with the rest of the page a footnote. And, and people made a living doing that. Okay. It was called publish or perish at colleges. If you didn't publish that kind of stuff, you lost your job. Uh, and as I said, you know, I was drunk, and the dean and the chairman of the department, they were assembling the firing squad to get ready in anticipation. Um, I was drunk every day, as I said. I couldn't do my work. Uh, I'd sit down at the computer. You know, my job was to write. In six months, I had written two paragraphs. I went to the office every day and I'd work on the computer, and I'd rearrange a word or move a sentence here or there, somehow thinking that if I got those two paragraphs right, the next 40 pages would just flow very easily. And, of course, nothing happened. I didn't get my work done. I didn't get, uh, I didn't get along with the priests I lived with. I didn't get along with my blood family that was of origin back in New Jersey. Um, and one day I went to the employee assistance director and I whined. Oh, did I? I complained about the unfairness of the system. I complained about how the rest of my colleagues on the faculty were greedy bastards. It was a business school. You know, they were supposed to be. They taught enlightened, organized greed. All right. Um, <laughs> And the employee assistance director was another priest. Uh, some people I don't know may have known. He was a longtime member of Al-Anon, Father Jim Ruddick. Uh, he looked at me, listened for about five minutes, looked at me and said, you're a reasonably intelligent young man. You should be able to do what everybody else on the faculty does. And so I knew right then and there I wasn't going to get any sympathy. And I had to move on to the next set of topics. And I did that for two hours, complaining about the, it was the system's fault, it was the, their fault, it was my mother's fault, everything was wrong, nothing was my fault. And then I paused for a few seconds and I blurted out, and I think I may have a problem with alcohol, I can't seem to stop drinking. And he looked at me and he said, well... You can try AA. If it works, that's fine. And if it doesn't work, it was only an hour. My first three thoughts were, one, an hour? An hour? You want me to spend an hour with those people? Number two, how can I live without Cabernet Sauvignon? 
And number three, why would I want to? I have spent many hours uh, praying over and reflecting on those three thoughts over the years. Uh, and, you know, since I brought them up now, I'll say, first, it was the first admission of my real powerlessness. Though I did not know it at the time when I said, I can't live without Cabernet Sauvignon, it really meant I can't live without drinking. And I don't know how that happened. If you had asked me five minutes before I went in to see the employee assistance director how important was alcohol in my life, I'd say, oh, well, you know, if you get a fine wine, it's a nice way to accent a gourmet meal, or at a social gathering, it would stimulate conversation, or it would help people relax in a, in a difficult situation. But I would never have thought it had gotten to the point of I can't live without drinking, right? Two, pretentiousness. I really did say to myself, Cabernet Sauvignon, and I have come to reflect. You know, I didn't say wine. I didn't say booze. I didn't say alcohol. I said Cabernet Sauvignon, and it made me realize that my life was pretentious. I was living a lie. I was trying to appear intelligent, witty, successful, sophisticated, knew what wine went with what dinner, talked about gourmet foods and things like that. You know, I knew red and white wine, and one was dry and one was sweet, and you had one with red meat and one with fish, and that was about it. Three, there was an incredible lack of perspective. My whole life was going down the tubes, right? Life, career, personal life, everything was a mess. And all I could think, well, why would you want me to give up drinking? And lastly, I just did not see the connection between all my problems and drinking. I whined to the employee assistance director for two hours and then I said, I let it slip out. You know, I think I may have a problem with drinking. I never connected those three big problems with the drinking. It never occurred to me that if you were drunk every day, you couldn't write coherently, right? No connection whatsoever. It took years of sobriety. And I say this um, as a very important lesson. Everything I know about my alcoholism and my sobriety, I only began to realize after I put the drink down. When I was drinking, my whole life was drink, don't drink, drink, don't drink, drink, don't drink. I, that's all I saw. That was the only question. And of course, not drinking is nothing. Drinking is something. And I always chose drinking. And I don't even know if I chose. I couldn't avoid it. The same thing is true about colleagues and friends and family. That was affected by my alcohol. Um, I gave this to Dave, but I'll read it again. It's, it's, it is my favorite line in the big book. It's from the doctor's opinion, not from Bill Wilson. And it's down on the bottom of page 28. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. I just thought about drinking all day long until I could get my hands on that first drink at 5 o'clock. Right? And as soon as I took a first sip, I was off to the races. There's nothing I could do. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, and you think he's going to say, well, then they're going to get drunk every day, they can't do the work, they're going to get fired from their job, they're going to wind up in a divorce, they can't get along with a spouse or be a partner. No, he doesn't say that. He says it's so elusive that they can no longer, no, no longer able to tell truth from falsity. And what it means really is you cannot destroy your life. You cannot do these things that are so bad 
unless you lie to yourself about it. You just block it out completely. I had a friend in the program, Art Boldman, he's dead now, sober many, many years, uh, died during COVID. But he said to me once, uh, said at a table we were at, uh, you know, if you tell a lie to another person, it's a moral problem. But if you lie to yourself, it's just plain stupid. And yet that's the only way we can live and drink and do and while doing so much damage to ourselves and not look at it. Um, despite those thoughts, I did go to the first meeting. I, um, I uh, oh, I guess I've missed my introduction. I came into the program in the end of September 1990. September 23rd, 1990 was my 40th birthday, and I drank and got drunk that day. And Wednesday, September 27th, 1990, uh, I went to my first meeting. It was the achievement group that meets at St. Paul's Lutheran Church on Main Street in Snyder, right? And from the first time that I heard people speak, I felt hope for the first time in years. Remember, I had said I stopped trying to drink. The big book refers to that feeling as that pitiful and hopeless demoralization. We just lose everything. We don't even have the strength to try. We don't even have the strength to think about stopping drinking. We're just going to drink, right? And I gave up all hope that I could stop drinking, and I gave up all hope that life could be any better. But when I went to that AA meeting, I heard people speaking honestly, and not just honestly about the alcohol they consumed. I heard people speaking honestly about life problems. How did you get along with your boss? What's going on at work? How do you get along with your spouse? What's going on with your friends? This is the stuff that life is really made of. Mine was falling apart and all those factors. And people were talking honestly about how to stay sober and how to handle those problems. Right? Uh, and that gave me hope. And to this day, to this day, you know, I'm up here as a speaker, but the thing that really gets me about AA meetings, I like going to meetings, is being able to listen to other alcoholics. Because when I listen to other alcoholics talk, I say, oh, oh, that's how he handled it. Oh, that's what he did. And then one of the next steps, some people say, if I can do it, you can do it. Um, I'm an academic and a fallibilist. Um, I don't know. Just because you do it doesn't mean I can do it. But I did realize that if you do it, I have to try. And that's the thing that motivates me when I come out of AA meetings. If you've done it, if you've tried, I have to try. And I have to keep trying uh, at working the program. Um, I went to that meeting for six weeks, and I would say, uh, hi, I'm Adolf. I'm here to find out whether I'm an alcoholic. Um, well, you know, I was actually worried that if I was not an alcoholic, they wouldn't let me stay and listen to them talk. You know, because I, as I said, their talking gave me hope. I was afraid they were going to kick me out if I wasn't an alcoholic. But I was walking around Delaware Park one morning and praying and daydreaming, and I just had this image that I was at a Saturday afternoon barbecue, and the hostess handed me a glass of white wine, and as I reached for it, I suddenly realized that I drank to kill the pain. I found life painful and difficult. And I wanted that drink of wine to kill the pain. And that's when I knew I was an alcoholic. I went to the next meeting and I said, hi, I'm Adolf, I'm an alcoholic. And there was a guy there, I don't know if anybody remembers him, football coach Don. He used to be the football coach at Amherst. He said, uh, let's give Adolf a round of congratulations. He finally got off the fence. Um Things happened from that. I started writing. Um, 
I, I began to do my research and put my writing together, and although it took me a year, I did accomplishment. I did accomplish it. Um, at three months sober, um, I was walking to my office one morning, and I just stopped. I still had all my problems. I had only started the writing. You know, I hadn't produced anything fully yet. Um, I still didn't get along with people. I still had problems with my own family. Um, the only thing different was that I was not drinking, but I realized it was better sober than it was drunk. Uh, and, and that was a kind of major accomplishment to think of that. I always go back to that. It was better sober than it was drunk. I kept going to that table, and it was a beginner's table. Uh, and there, one night, a woman, you know, the usual thing at a beginner's table, let's limit our discussion to the first three steps. And one night, the woman who was chairing the table talked about the second step. And usually, when you get to the second step, uh, if you look at it in the big book, if you look at it in the 12 and 12, it's all about whether you believe in God, right? And that's usually the discussion that happens. But she looked at the last phrase in the step, and it was the first time that I had heard anything like that, right? Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Well, if I had to be restored to sanity, you know, that meant there was something insane about my life. And that's the first time that I really took a hard, clear look at it. My drinking was insane. I was destroying my life and everything that I had spent 30 years in school uh, seeking to achieve. I, just in passing, when I was in the seminary in California, um, there was this nun who gave me a birthday card, and she said, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but aren't you in the 29th grade? Um, that's what we did. Um, but that was the first thing. And, and, and I, I always focus on that because the first step says nothing about insanity. The first step says my life was unmanageable. Unmanageable is such a nice, middle-class, sanitized word. The truth is it wasn't just unmanageable. It was insane. Maybe not the kind of insanity that they'd lock you up in an institution, but it was insane, and I needed to do something about that. The last significant thing that happened out there, there was a guy at the table named Chuck. He was 10 or 12 years sober, um, and he was a really committed person to AA. It was his second 10 years sober. Uh, he had a business and things like that, and Something happened. This guy just started jumping up and down, and you know, you got to work the steps. You got to work the steps. You got to work the steps. And what the fuck is he talking about? Right? And it, the next meeting I went to, you know, when we read the preamble and the how it works, I never paid attention to that. I always thought that was a time for me to socialize with the guy next to me. And so for the first time, I heard somebody mention the steps. Steps, and then they actually read them. Oh, right, and and he starts, and then at the meeting again, he's jumping up and down. You got to work the steps. You got to work the steps. And finally, I heard that there were things called step tables. There weren't just beginners' tables. There were step tables. And so the third time he did it, I went to a step table, and he came over to me after the meeting and he said, "Congratulations, you're on your way." Um, I ran into him uh, after that year. I had a change in my work schedule, and I had to work Wednesday nights. So couldn't go to that meeting. Uh, I went to a different meeting, and I ran into In fact, I went to the, the meeting at Deerhurst Chapter 9, which eventually became my home group. Uh, but I ran into Chuck. He was there one night when I was about a year and a half sober, 
And he asked me, how long are you How long are you still in the program? It's good to see. How long are you sober? And I said, i got about a year and a half now. And he said, that's good. The denial ought to be wearing off about now. And I said to him, well, I, I, I don't think, uh, I think I have things pretty rationally analyzed. That's what I said to him. In my head, I'm thinking, fuck you, there's no denial in my life. <laughs> now, one of the characteristics of going to step tables at that time, I could swear every other table somebody wanted step four. Right, And, of course, I hadn't done step four. And I always like to look intelligent. So I tried to mumble about, you know, introspection is good for the soul and we need to do inventory and sound like I knew something. Right? <laughs> All the while, I hadn't done it. And, well, after the incident with Chuck, I finally went away on a retreat and I did step four. And I did not I, – I, let me say this um, – I have the reputation of being a step Nazi now, but that came from making a lot of mistakes. I went away on retreat, and I took the 12 and 12 with me, and I read it and prayed over it. And I would read until I came to something, and then I'd write it down. And then I'd read some more until I came to something that moved me, and I'd write it down. And I did this for two days. And at the end of the two days, I went back to look at or read, and all the things that I had written were the same thing. The, the situation had changed, the military, the seminary, the college, work experience. But the pattern of the behavior was the same. I worked very hard. i capable of very hard work. But then I became dissatisfied because I don't think the boss patted me on the back enough. And I really wanted the boss to love me. It, I, I mean, I actually wrote the word down, you know, did the colonel in the ROTC, did he love me? Did the president of the college love me? And this is about work. What the hell is going on? And I finally came to realize that I worked to get loved. And there's a fundamental disconnect there. My boss wanted work. I wanted love. You know, they're close. <laughs> I, I'll work very hard to get love. And so there's a lot of work. But, you know, you're looking for something like this when you choose a career, and I, I'm like this. They're not quite fitting together, right? And so that had to change. Um, as I said, I did publish that article, published two articles uh, with a colleague in the Management Information System Department. She did the article for the Business Journal. I did the article for a law journal. Uh, we both got credit for these publications. She got tenure, and I lost my job anyway, um, and left the priesthood. And, uh, you know, I credit AA with giving me the honesty and the courage to at least do that. I I'm not saying that I had it figured out. Uh, I just knew I couldn't keep living a lie that way, and I didn't want to give up the girlfriend at the time. Um, she gave me up later on, uh, and I have to admit, honestly, I drove her away. Um, but at any rate, two and a half years, I'm out of the priesthood. I had one year to run terminal contract. I could still teach. I was doing a job search. I was sending out resumes like crazy. I was getting no responses. Uh, one guy sent me back a rejection letter and I have it. I still have it. I saved it in my files because I thought, wow, this is a good sign. It's the only person who's at least taken the time to write a response to me, even if it was no job. Um, and in the midst of this, I was overcome with an obsession to blow my brains out. I mean, it just started, oh, no letters from another college in the mail. I'll just get the gun and blow my brains out. All right, and it became really frightening because in one sense, I didn't want to kill myself. I was frightened by that thought. And in another sense, it was do it, do it, do it and get it over with. And that became a process of, I, I mean, I didn't have any more strength. I had worked as much as I could on that article. I was exhausted. I didn't have any reserves. I used to think I, I studied some psychology. I could figure myself out. 
and nothing. I couldn't do anything. And I just remember falling on the floor and saying, please, God, just let me not blow my brains out today. I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow, or next week, next week. Just let me not kill myself today. Let me get through the day. And I did. And then it came back tomorrow, and I prayed again the same way. And it went like that for days, for weeks. And then finally, um, not finally, but then eventually I had a day where it didn't happen. And then it came back again, and I went to like every other day it happened. And every third day, and then once a week, and then once every other week, once a month. Once it came back after three months, but eventually it went away and I was able to live, right? And with some peace and without that terrible fear, right? Gradually, but it happened. And that's where I learned one day at a time. When I went to that beginner's table, people said, you know, you only have to stay sober today. You only have to do it one day at a time. And I would think, I didn't say it out loud. I didn't want to fight with people. But I would say, that's the stupidest thing in the world. You know you can't drink for the rest of your life because you're drunk and it gets you into trouble. And you're there telling them just one day at a time. But when I had that obsession to kill myself, that's where I learned one day at a time. Sure, I hope I never want to kill myself. I hope that I want to live with whatever God provides me for the rest of my life. But I can only do something about today. I have a friend at the uh, Clarence Men's Group. He was trying to describe Alcoholics Anonymous to his daughter, and he said, well, we try not to drink one day at a time. And his daughter said, well, of course, Dad. Or we try to live one day at a time. And he said, well, of course, Dad. Nobody can live five days at a time. And, and it sounds so obvious to somebody who doesn't have this disease. They understand that. We don't. I hope I never pick up a drink again. I hope that, sincerely, fervently. But the only thing I can do about it is to work the program today. And tomorrow, when tomorrow becomes today, I'll work that program again for the day. That's one day at a time. And lately, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on that. And I can finally say, um, you know, one day at a time is really about trust in the higher power. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the old Latin Catholic Mass. I can still quote from it because I was a big boy. But the Our Father used to be in Latin, Pater Noster, Quius in Celi, Sanctificetur, Nomen Tuum, right? The second half of it, give us this day our daily bread. Panem Nostrum Quies, Panem Nostrum Quotidiem da Nobis Hodie. That word, Quotidiem, Quota Diem. Quota is the Latin word for enough, measure, portion, right? And diem is the word for the day. Just give me what I need for this day. And it's not just bread. That's my prayer. Give me what I need to get through this day sober and trying to follow the right way, right? I get through the day sober. I don't always get the right thing done, but one of the things that has happened is that if something goes wrong, I make my amends quickly, right? And that's a good way to live. I'm not stuck wallowing in the bad mistakes that I've made, right? I can fix it up and lead a good life, make amends with people, and move on. Um, am I okay on time? When I was three years sober, um, my, my contract at Canisius ended. Uh, I got a letter from, uh, I needed a place to live. Uh, I needed money to live. Uh, I didn't have much of the money. And um, 
a colleague of mine and a good friend on the faculty at Canisius got a Fulbright grant from the government to teach in Africa and work on management of small groups there as a research project. Uh, and his daughter was going to live in the house and take care of the two cats. And then his daughter moved to California on him suddenly. And so he said to me, can you live in the house and you don't have to pay us any rent, just pay the utilities um, and you can have the house and you have to take care of the cats. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, God. Right. And uh, I, I, my brother, my older brother was also an attorney. He was sending me some part-time work, research work, and paying me $10 an hour. And, you know, I was living with that. And uh, I got this uh, call from uh, a lawyer in Buffalo, his secretary, and she said, uh, Mr. Buckeye wants you to come in for an interview. And I went in for an interview, and uh, the guy said, this is the most fascinating resume I've ever seen. And I said, and then nothing happened, you know, and I'm waiting and waiting and nothing happened. And then about three weeks later, I get another call. And, you know, I had moved to that other house at the time from an apartment. And uh, the secretary said, you're a difficult man to find. Mr. Buck, I want you to come in for another view. I went to go in for another view. And I'm thinking, well, why doesn't he make up as I thought he liked it? And, and he just said, I wanted to tell you in person you got the job. Um, and as it turned out, that was the only job I ever got. It's the only offer. Uh, and I stayed in the job 25 years. It worked out wonderfully for me. My boss and I got along. Uh, I grew there and was able to help people. Uh, when I went into the job, I was only thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, uh, the clerk to a federal judge, and it's an important job, and I'll get a big paying job afterward. And, and it didn't work out that way. It worked out. But we got along very well. He was able to use my talents um, in a way that was very productive. Uh, he frequently thanked me for my input, uh, and he took my ideas about half the time. And, and I say that not as a sarcastic comment, but as a real sign of progress. You know, my boss looked at me. He wanted my input. And about half the time, he said, yeah, okay. And the other half the time, he said, no, 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 that's not it. But somebody he said, yeah, that's it. Or sometimes he'd come back a day later and he said, I, I didn't think it was so good, but maybe you talk to me more about that. And so I really felt valued uh, and I made a contribution. You know, I, I performed a socially useful function. I always want, I was the kind of guy the, the 12 and 12 talked about, either wanted to be king of the hill, top of the heap, or hide underneath the pile. I couldn't struggle just daily, one with another fellow, one with a teammate, one with, with a friend, right? A friend among friends, a teammate. I, I had to be on the top or I had to hide. And this gave me a socially useful function. I didn't have to be the chief. I didn't have to run away. I just had to perform a socially useful function, and I began to accept myself. Um, when I was three and a half years sober, I noticed that um, I had a lot of self-pity in my life. Um, that general depressed funk that I was always in, you know, mm, um, it was called self-pity, right? I, before that, I never did. And, and then I got to thinking, why, why didn't I notice this before? You know, and, and I came to realize that self-pity was like air. It it was around me everywhere, and you don't notice the air until you smell a skunk, and then it stinks. Oh, right. But when the air is normal, you don't notice it, and that self-pity was the normal characteristic of my life. Uh, and I realized I had to do something about it. And I also realized, from part of my religious training, I can't change my feelings or my heart. Um. 
but I don't have to sit down and wallow in it. I was out raking leaves once, and I had an attack of self-pity. And, you know, every pull of the rake was a struggle. I had to keep doing it. And I think it took me six hours to do a job that I could have done in an hour and a half. And at the end of it, I looked back and I said, at least I didn't sit. At least I didn't sit. I struggled through it. And that became the way to deal with it. Um, and, and it became a way, yeah, to, I, I don't generally fall into that trap anymore. Sometimes, and I watch it for the inter, but I don't generally fall into that trap anymore. Um, I always hate to say this, and I have to be honest. I only went to one meeting a week for my first five years in the program. That is not a good thing. Um, I, I, because I don't want to give the impression, see, all you need is one meeting a week to, to get sober. But I did notice that when I went to that meeting, I'd come out of the meeting and I'd be really happy and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. That was wonderful. And the next day I'd be really happy. Oh, thank, this is just wonderful. And somebody would cut me off on 33 and I, as I was commuting into work, and I said, boy, that guy must be in a hurry. I wonder what's bothering him, you know, and I'd drive in. And then the following day I'd get a little edgier and the third day somebody would cut me off and I'd go, oh, and I'd chase him for two miles. And I noticed this and I said, you know, I, I mean, I feel so good at, for two days after the meeting. I wonder if I went to another meeting in the week, would I feel good like that after that other meeting? Uh, and so I put a second meeting in my schedule and lo and behold, I did feel good. And I said, hey, this is wonderful. I put a third meeting into my schedule. Uh, and, and that produced a better feeling. Now, at the time, I tried a fourth meeting, and that was just a little too much at the time. Bear with me, I'll get to it. But um, it was at that time that I also joined my home group. Uh, it was August of 1995. I was coming up on my fifth anniversary, and I think for the first time there was the guy who was the chairperson of the meeting talked about joining the group, and I heard it. And I didn't want to join in August to have an anniversary in September and get a coin. You know, I'm here one month, give me a coin. Uh, so I waited until October to join. Uh, and that's the reason, actually, that uh, um, I only have medallions from number six on. I don't have one to five. Uh, but um, when I joined a home group, I was uh, sitting around, uh, standing around one night, ready to leave, refilling my coffee mug. Uh, and Jeff Lasky said to me, uh, you know, you can help clean up. Oh, oh, okay. And, and I joined. Now, you're not talking about heavy lifting. There were two coffee pots, regular and decaf, and you had four guys washing the pieces to the two coffee pots. So we're not talking about heavy work. But as we were cleaning up, there was a meeting after a meeting, and I became friends with these guys. And it really was a home group. It was a place I wanted to go to because they were people I wanted to be with, and that helped to support my sobriety. I was with them at the step table. I was with them in the kitchen for cleanup afterward. We'd talk outside the meeting. It really became a home and a real support to sobriety. Um, when I was eight years sober, I was feeling pretty pleased with myself. I thought I had the program down pat. Uh, I thought I knew the stuff. The only problem was I saw other people. Um, there were two people in particular, uh, Don Harvey and... Uh, what was her name? Elliot Leavers, uh, I think. Uh, Elliot, I know, is dead. Elliot had women following her everywhere, right? I mean, 
she was a real Pied Piper and a real help to people. And Don, the same way, sponsored a lot of people. And I'm sitting around, well, why, why aren't these people coming to me to get my wisdom for how to work the program? And uh, Linda H., uh, at the step table one night, started talking about how much sobriety improved her life. Um, she had destroyed a marriage, destroyed jobs, uh, and, and then got sober, gradually put her life together, met somebody, got married. They started a business together. Her life is improving all the way. And then she said at a year 11, the shit hit the fan and everything started to go wrong. And I wanted a drink and it was hard to struggle. And I was listening to this woman and I said, geez, I, I'm eight years sober. And that was at 11. Holy shit, that could happen to me. I got to do something. And so I started, I said, I got to put some more effort into this. And I started reading a step out of the 12 and 12 every night um, as part of my reflection. And I did that all the way through. She said she was in that struggle from years 11 to 13. And I got to year 13 and wow, I made it. And I starting to feel pleased again. And some other guy at a table is talking about how at year 13, everything was good for him up to year 13, and then he had a problem, and that problem lasted for two years. And I said, oh, shit. And so I start reading more and, and praying more and helping at the meetings, and and then I got through year 15. And then one time after a meeting, I met this old guy, and he would say, he said to me, uh, how long have you been sober? And I said, 15 years. And he said, that's a very tricky time in AA. <laughs> mm. and then I heard him and he said, well, how long, he's talking to somebody, how long have you been sober? Three years. Said, that's a very difficult year in AA. Somebody else, 22 years. Oh, that's a, that's a especially tricky time in AA. And finally, it didn't matter what year you said. He always said, well, yeah, that's a difficult time or a year time. But in one sense, it's really true. You know, it becomes easier, but it does become trickier. How do I lead a good, sober life today? I have to progress in this sobriety or alcoholism will come. I mean, alcoholism doesn't go away. Right, we keep it in abeyance. We, the big book says, we suffer from an illness that only contact with a higher power can conquer. The higher power conquers the illness. It's not me that's cured, and so I need to do things that keep me in contact with that higher power, and I need to do that every day if I want to be sober. Because if I don't, as Doctor Silkworth says. Alcoholics are essentially restless, irritable, and discontent. That's the default position. What is it like? Everything pisses me off. Everyone and everything. And unless I do something about that every day, that's what will come out. What enables me to be peaceful and calm most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, with people is the fact that I work this program. It gives, whether it's go to a meeting, read a step from the big book, work a step, say a prayer, give somebody a ride, uh, whatever it is, uh, make a telephone call to another alcoholic, see how it's going. Those are the things that work the program in my life. And I need in, in whatever year or situation I am in to find the stuff I need to keep me sober. When I was 19 years sober, um, the workload at the bankruptcy court suddenly skyrocketed. Congress had passed a law cutting down on bankruptcy eligibility, and everybody filed before the deadline. And in six months, the caseload more than doubled. Uh, I began working nine and ten hours a day, six and seven days a week. Um, and it was really a strain, and I felt the stress, and I was getting short-tempered. And I realized I needed more meetings, 
not less. I had less time, but I needed meetings. If I was going to work with less free time, I needed more meetings to keep me calm and presentable to the public and to the other lawyers I worked with. Uh, and so I upped the meetings, and at that period of my life, I was going to six to ten meetings a week. You may think that's crazy, but that's what kept me grounded and and calm enough to deal with life. Uh, as I say, restless, irritable, and discontent will come back if I don't apply something of the program to my life every day. When I was 21 years sober, the second most significant, the most significant effect event in my life and my sobriety was getting sober. But at 21 years sober, the second most significant event happened. Uh, a fellow at the table that I went to the Deerhurst meeting, how it works on Saturday mornings at 7.30. Uh, believe me, it was a lot easier when I only lived four miles up the road in Tonawanda. It's a lot more difficult to drive in 20 miles from Clarence with going through 19 red lights. Um, that tie things up. But uh, a, a fellow at that table called me up and he asked me whether I would go through the big book with him. Now, at the time, I was 21 years sober and he was 17 years sober. And I need to tell you, I, I had a certain college policy. When I was in college, I was a mathematics and physics major and everything was in these big, thick textbooks. Literature courses, you know, like where you'd get a textbook, uh, the thrust of the American short story or the development of the novel in the English language, right? And then they'd give you 10 other books to read that you had to go to the library to get. Well, if there was a course and it had outside reading, I didn't sign up for that course, right? If it wasn't in the textbook, I didn't read it. I went, I told you, I went to step tables all the time, and at step tables, we used the 12 and 12. So I was 21 years sober. I owned a big book, but I never read it. You know, I mean, there was one phrase, uh, what was it in the third step prayer? Free me from the bondage of self. And, you know, there might be another little quote here and there, but otherwise, I didn't know anything about the big book. And I didn't want Bob to know that I didn't know anything about the big book, and then I... And I paused long and should I do this, not do it, work with it? What? And I said yes. I, thought, I, I paused a little bit, but then I said yes. Um, and we started. We met every week for lunch, and we did four pages at a time. From the title page, from the very first page of the big book, four pages at a time, We'd meet and we'd talk about those four pages. And we were still doing it. Um, but we went through the big book twice, and then we went through the 12 and 12, and then we compared the big book to the 12 and 12, reading them both at the same time uh, to get the parallel passages. Um, and it was wonderful because what we were doing was describing our own experience and seeing how to take our own experience and relate it to the words in the big book. And that's where I finally began to understand that stuff. Um, I'm not really a big book thumper, but uh, at a meeting, a Clarence Men's meeting once, a friend of mine, Tom, said, I want to be a big book thumper like Adolf. And I said, I'm not really. But the way to do it, if you really want to look like you're a big book thumper, Pick five passages out of the big book, you know, like um, to die an alcoholic death or live life on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives for a newcomer. Or um, the one from the step, relieve me of the bondage of self. Or page 30, it's the enduring dream of every alcoholic that one day he will be able to control his drinking like a normal person. And things, you know, you, you, you get five of these things and you drop them here every once in a while here and there, and people think you're a big book thumper. And like you really know it. I struggle with it like everyone else. When I was 25 years sober, um, I was at a step table at the Amherst Snyder meeting and Chuck Davis was chairing the table. Chuck is dead now. Um, long years of sobriety, 40-some years when he died. 
and he was reading step 11. It was the step of the week. We just, it was a progressive step table, so we went through the 12 steps um, about four times a year. Uh, but it was prayer and meditation. And, uh, I mean, I was a strong advocate, prayer and meditation. You can't go wrong with prayer and meditation, prayer and meditation. But he kept reading the step, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And I said, you know, 25 years in the program, when did they put that in there? 25 years, I'm a big advocate of prayer and meditation, and I, I never remember hearing that. But I realized it's something I had to pray for. Look, there's a lot of things we pray for. I'm not going to tell you, don't pray for your family or don't pray to be healthy or things like that. Um, but that event was a significant reorientation of my focus to the program. I listened to a guy on disc, Don Major, and he talks about, look, I no longer, talks about blatantly, look, if you're praying to feel good, right, and have your character defects taken away so they don't bother you, he said, you might as well be paying for a, br a brand new Ferrari. You're not going to get it. But he goes on further. He says, you know, I no longer pray for the health of my family or the safety of my daughter. Now, it's a strange thing. I no longer pray. Don't get me wrong. I don't want my daughter to be mugged. I don't want my wife to get cancer. I very fervently hope that they stay healthy. But what I pray for is that whatever happens, we will be able to get through it sober and in a good manner. That's what you pray for. Um, a friend of mine, Dave P., talks about um, this alcoholic, an older guy, has having a problem because his adult son was also an alcoholic and abusing drugs, and the guy was talking to him all the time and couldn't get him to stop. And so the guy's talking to his sponsor, and he's going on for months about how he's trying to tell his son to stop drinking. And finally, the sponsor says, why don't you stop praying for your son? The guy looks at him, what the hell kind of advice is that? And the sponsor gets impatient. He says, why don't you do what the step says? It doesn't say pray for your son to go to AA. The step says pray that you know God's will for you today and you get the power to carry it out. And so the guy stopped praying. for, And of course now there's silence when he prays because he hasn't got this litany of things to pray about his son to God. And he has to start listening when he prays instead of telling God what he wants. And he learns to listen. And then he learns to listen to his son and not argue with his son. And then, because he's not arguing with the son, the son doesn't have an excuse to drink. So the son's got to go to AA on his own. And the thing starts working out. Right? I pray only for knowledge of God's will for me today and the power to carry that out. Step 12 talks about a spiritual awakening. I do not know if I've had a spiritual awakening. I can assure you I have no visions of the Trinity. There's no halo up there. No light is shining down from above. Light has not filled my room or the wind blow through it. Right? None of those things that the book describes as a spiritual experience or the saints describe as a spiritual experience. But I hope I have changed. I am a little calmer and more patient, and I can point to two things that are really significant in my life because of the program. A, when something goes wrong, although my natural tendency is to want to blame someone else, really now my first instinct is, what's my part in it? I got to do an inventory. What's my part in it? Because that's the only thing I can do anything about. Step 10 in the 12 and 12 says, when anything upsets us greatly, there's something wrong with us. It doesn't mean that what happened is our fault. 
right? And when I was new in the program, people, women read that especially, and they said, what am I, a doormat? Everything is my fault? No. The, somebody hits you, it may not be your fault. It, it's probably not your fault. It was uncalled for. But the anger, the real resentment rising up, that has nothing to do with the hit. That's something in here with me. And I got to look at that and find out what it is if I'm going to live calmly and soberly, right? And the other one is, if something goes wrong, what's my responsibility, right? How do I deal with the problem? Um, because I can only do something about me. I can't do anything about the world. When I came into the program, I complained about everything, and people said to me, you need to learn to live life on life's terms. And I didn't say anything, but in my head I'm thinking, you got some fucking parallel universe I can go to where I can live life on different terms? I'm living life on life's terms, and I hate every one of them. And I began to realize, you know, it took time in the program. If, there's not, if I can't do something about some, a situation, it's not my problem, right? My problem is to deal with it. My problem is I have to grow to meet the circumstances. Um, and that's what I look to do. I don't know if I always succeed, but those two changes in attitude are the biggest things for me. And I think I said before, if I do something wrong, I make amends quickly. Those are real big changes. Uh, is it a spiritual awakening, a spiritual experience? I don't know. But it's a big personality change, and it works very well for keeping me sober. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.